all. So uh, I hope you enjoyed um, the two days of conference and the different activities um, we have. So just wanted to give you some numbers. So we had 186 people register. Um, it's funny because we had the goal of 185 and we had one person registering here. So I think we were pretty good at estimating. Um, we have 58 students, so that was about uh, a little bit more than 30%. So we're very happy to have students. And I was particularly happy with the demos and work in progress in that conversation. I think the, the time was short, but um, I hope you had enjoyed that session as well. So I'm just gonna introduce the panel. Um, is Creative Learning at Scale. Um, I'm just gonna introduce Mitch, the moderator. Uh, so I worked with Mitch for a number of years. I think it was one of the first people I met at MIT and I had worked with Mitch in several projects. So I'm happy to, to have Mitch here. So thank you, Mitch, for agreeing to moderate the panel. Uh, so Mitch, um, his interest is in developing technologies and activities that engage people, especially kids in creative learning. Uh, he runs a lifelong kindergarten research group at the Media Lab. Um, we heard Sayam Indu yesterday, so Mitch and his group created the Scratch programming environment and community, and we learned a little bit yesterday about um, some of the, the numbers, um, 20, 20 million projects right now in Scratch. Um, the group has also um, a very, very close relationship with LEGO, um, promoting some of the LEGO robotics, like LEGO Mindstorms, and also we do. Uh, Mitch has um, also, um, not only the, you know, Scratch is, is what I thought was uh, very relevant to this community, but also has created the Computer Clubhouse uh, that has more than 100 um, 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 after-school programs all over the world. Um, Mitch receives, um, has received a physics degree from Princeton. Uh, he also has a master's and PhD in computer science from MIT. Um, he has a number of publications. Uh, one of them was um, his uh, thesis, around his thesis, Turtle Terms and Traffic Jams. Um, and just to finalize, um, he's received a number of awards, but uh, mainly the Magro Prize in Education in 2011, and also the Ed Media Pioneer Award in 2013. So I just want to welcome Mitch, and he'll introduce the panel. Thanks a lot, Claudia. Before we get started, while we have this slide up, I just thought I want to mention, we've decided to be in taking questions from the audience. We're going to do it uh, through Twitter. So if you use the hashtag uh, LAS17ED, you can send questions through the panel. And then towards the end, Catherine will be you know, looking at the, uh, the, <laughs> at the stream and pull out questions and share them uh, with the panel later on. So Canel, we'll get started. It's, it's great for, to be here. We're really pleased to be at Learning at Scale. Uh, and in our session, we decided to, motivated by the name of the conference, we want to focus especially on creative learning at scale. And when we think about creative learning, we're thinking about learning experiences that help people develop as creative thinkers. And we want to focus especially on this because I think all the panelists really believe that um, in the world today, there's nothing more important than helping people develop as creative thinkers to be able to address uncertain and new situations uh, in a creative and innovative ways. And I think there's particular challenges with how we can think about uh, supporting creative learning at scale. So we want to focus especially on what are the ways that uh, we can support creative learning technologies, activities, uh, you know, and spreading around the world. Uh, we're really pleased for the panel to have uh, three panelists, Karen Brennan, uh, who's a professor uh, here in Cambridge at Harvard Graduate School of Education, Chris Kobo, uh, who has been working at Uruguay at the Foundation Sebal. We'll be talking more about the One Lap per, per Child National Project there. And Philip Schmidt from here at the Media Lab, where he leads the learning initiative here at the Media Lab. So we're going to organize the panel starting each of the three panels. will make introductory statements telling a little about some of the projects they've worked on that relate to the theme of creative learning at scale. And then we'll open up into a conversation among the panel before taking to uh, some of the questions from the audience. So with that, I'll hand off to Karen. Thank you. So 
the relay race. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, I'm a faculty member at HGSC. I've been there for five years, but I was a Media Lab grad. So every time I'm in this building, it feels like being at home. I was one of Mitch's students in, in the venerable lifelong kindergarten group. So as Mitch mentioned, we each have a couple of minutes to sort of set the stage for how we think about the idea of creating learning at scale. And I wanted to just say a little bit about the number and kind of people that I'm thinking about. So I, I spend most of my time thinking about 55.6 million learners. It's a <laughs> every, big class. Every <laughs> single one of them, yeah, it's a big group. Who are these people? Uh, these are the pre-K through grade 12 students enrolled in public and private schools in the United States. So that's where I spend most of my sort of energy and time thinking about. And I really think a lot about the types of learning experiences that are happening in the settings that these kids find themselves in, or maybe more appropriately, what types of learning experiences they're not happening. So when we think about the classroom, that may not be the first place you think of when you think about powerful and creative learning experiences. And so a lot of my work is motivated by this question of like, why are the learning experiences that happen here, where here is the classroom, so often not particularly creative? And there are all sorts of factors. You can think about it from policy perspective. You can think about it from an organizational perspective. I spent a lot of time thinking about it from the perspective of teachers as agents at the classroom level. And there's lots to say more than in the five minutes I have been allocated to, <laughs> to comments. I'm going to crush it down. And to sort of a key issue facing teachers is that they are asked to support the types of learning experiences in classrooms that they themselves have never been supported in having. And I think this is really beautifully expressed by Hilda Borko and company. If we want schools to offer more powerful learning opportunities for students, we must offer more powerful learning opportunities for teachers. It's kind of obvious, and yet time and time again, we are not offering that type of support. And so this is the starting place for all of the work uh, my research group does at HGSC. And it's this sort of central theory of change that if teachers are having powerful, magical, creative, whatever modifier you want to use, learning experiences themselves as learners, that gives them inspiration and ideas to then support the kids. It's a simple theory. So I wanted to give an example of, again, briefly, of how this has been playing out in our own work at HGSC. So as I mentioned, proud lifelong kindergarten graduate. I was here 2007 to 2012, first five years of Scratch's life. And I was really excited by the ways in which K-12 teachers were interested in bringing Scratch into the classroom. But too often, they were creating opportunities for kids with Scratch that were a little paint by numbers and weren't really embracing the full expressive power and potential of Scratch. And it's not that there were any lack of examples or inspiration on the site. So they were looking at the site and seeing what was possible, but they weren't sure how to translate it into the classroom. So it's like, maybe the Scratch website isn't enough. So I built a companion website for teachers called Scratch Ed, where there were materials that supported them pedagogically. It's like, so you want to do something creative. How might you do that? So they were getting inspiration. They were having access to the community. They were having access to other types of resources that might make it possible. But there was still a gap. Even with something like the Scratch website, even like with something like the Scratch Ed website, there was a gap between teachers thinking about what was possible and what was actually possible. And the gap was just, again, lack of experience. So that led us, very much inspired by EdCamp. I don't know how many people are fans of EdCamp, familiar with EdCamp, looking at Justin, I know Philip is. Um, so, so we developed a Scratch Ed Meetup Network. And so this is a relatively new project, but teachers designing, learning, for themselves, for each other. And the idea is really rooted in sort of foundations from the learning sciences of what we know makes for powerful learning, both for adults, but also for kids. And so learners need opportunities to imagine the possibilities for learning. So they're seeing ideas on Scratch. They're seeing ideas on Scratch Ed. They're meeting face to face, talking about these experiences, engaging them interacting with other learners, again, an essential component of learning, and then that last component about engaging and reflective practice. And so these are the sort of big ideas that motivate my work. And with that, I'll sort of pause there and pass it on. There you go. Cool. OK. Do we have the slides? Yeah, yeah, you should just advance it. it should work. Ah, awesome. So 
Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back to the MIT. And this one is going to be particularly challenging because I have to summarize 10 years of this program in five minutes. I'll do, I'll do my best. 30 seconds per year, that's no problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Uruguay is this program that 10 years ago, inspiring the World Laptop Per Child Initiative, uh, decided to provide computers and laptops to every single student from 7 to 15 years old and to every single teacher, plus providing uh, connectivity to the schools. That was kind of the first activity, this, the first kind of goal, the first layer of the implementation in order to be sure that everyone will have the same kind of access. But immediately after, uh, and along with the training of teachers, uh, Plan Saival provided a number of platforms for fostering the development of a second language, math skills, community of practice, a number of things. But I will focus one, in one in particular, which are the learning to do coding and robotics, which I think is more suitable for this community. Um, so the first thing that you have to do if you want to implement that at a larger scale, you have to uh, work deeply on the infrastructure. And that means to get rid of the computer's room and, and create maker space and fab labs and spaces for experimentation. Plus providing robots and, and physical and chemical sensors and, and drones and, and 3D printers and a number of things plus uh, uh, different ways of uh, learning how to code. Now, uh, along with the infra infrastructure, you have to work deeply with teachers, uh, not to the teachers, but with the teachers, readjusting the teacher's curriculum. Uh, not only to, to develop expertise on how to do Scratch, for instance, but to better understand under which circumstances it's a good idea to bring that into the classroom. And, and the third element is an ecosystem of innovation, which means creating activities at a local level, at a national level, uh, international contests. Uh, plus, uh, for instance, they organize a number of MOOCs on Scratch and developing apps, uh, things that can be either taken by the students or the teachers and are being increasingly successful. The image that you see there are teachers uh, getting online in video conference with other colleagues in other schools transferring the knowledge they have. And I think this is really interesting because it's a much more distributed way of providing innovation. Now, certainly the, the goal is to foster the idea of using computational concepts to solve all sorts of problems. But uh, I wouldn't say that the technological understanding is enough. So we try to focus on the idea of uh, bringing the kids to reflect, and the teachers as well, to know how these tools operate in different contexts and to what extent the use of these tools and these rationals can affect the context. So you have a much more compelling understanding of uh, how technology can be brought into daily life. And the other thing that I thought was interesting to mention briefly is that today seems to be a discussion that is uh, you either promote the digital citizenship or you foster the idea of learning to do coding. And I don't think it's or, but it's and. And the, the way of overcoming that challenge is when you um, create opportunities for solving problems which are relevant for their communities. So you open these calls, you explore what things are relevant for the teachers, the parents, the learners, and then you decide things that could be interesting for them. And that means a lot of negotiation in terms of uh, building in a distributed way knowledge uh, through platforms and face-to-face -face and reflecting on the social and ethical implications of technology and algorithms. We all know that today algorithms are making the internet looking different than it was used to be a few years ago. Uh, now, the, from the pedagogical perspective, um, this initiative is strongly inspired in puppet constructionism. Um, so the idea is to provide tools for thinking. So no, it's not enough to create these experiences, but also to reflect on the experiences and to bring time to, to think about what are the things that are bringing you all the ways of learning. So it's not thinking about thinking, but how is it? <laughs> I always get confused with that. Um, so that means project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, um, um, addressing problems that could be relevant, like global warming, the community, how to make the, the school a better place these sort of things, and, and that also is certainly stressing the relevance of STEAM, but also encouraging kids to do risk-taking and self-driving their own passions and uh, being open to mistakes and these sort of things. And I think one of the aspects that bring success in this policy is they seem to be rather flexible in terms of you have opportunities to bring all these tools that I mentioned into the traditional classes uh, so kids are encouraged to connect the dots. But at the same time, there are plenty of time for exploration. 
So again, uh, the multi-grade exploration goes way beyond the curriculum, the program, the classes, and we are seeing very interesting things in that sense. So when you, in terms of large scale, when you want to provide something that is relevant for an, a country, a whole country, uh, you should understand that this doesn't mean that everyone will be on board. You will have people more interested and some of them who will be either more pa passive or more reluctant. But when you set this framework, uh, people who wants to teach or wants to learn in a different way, they find that this is the new normal. Thank you. Thanks, I don't have any slides. Um, I was gonna take it and then click and then say, what, Mitch, did you forget to put my slides on there? But um, no, I didn't, I didn't bring any slides. Um, uh, so I think when we talk about uh, learning at scale or creative learning at scale, uh, we often, our mind kind of goes to um, certain ideas around scale very quickly that often uh, center on technology, so scale through some new technology or use of technology, um, and also often uh, scale in kind of a more, I think, traditional way where there's some central repository and you send information or content to lots of people um, and in more of a broadcast um, model. And then finally, um, I think with the MOOCs, uh, there's kind of a third dimension and those are activities that can easily be automated. So that can be supported by a computer. Um, but still having this idea that there's somehow a, a center somewhere that sends out content and information um, to lots and lots of people. And of course, adding more people to this uh, is very cheap. And so it's, this is a very attractive idea, especially uh, if you're trying to reach lots of people with learning and education opportunities. And so I think that's kind of a little bit the story of the MOOCs over the last few years. And one of the results of this approach is that um, maybe we um, don't always start with the best models of learning, kind of some of the things that Karen was talking about, and then try to scale those, but we start with whatever we can scale. Um, and in my own work, what, what I've, I've kind of gone through this, uh, and, and what I've seen is then those, those things can scale and, and you know, that there's a lot of excitement about them, but you end up reaching people who, who largely are already doing relatively fine. Like they have opportunities for education, they're often highly motivated, and, and you know all of this. But um, in some ways, <clears throat> this is the story of the nonprofit organization that I co-founded. And I'm really excited also to be saying these things when one of my co-founders, Stian Hakleff, is sitting in the audience who I haven't seen in a few years. And so we have kind of gone through this story. We started online, we disseminated materials, we reached lots of people, but the people we reached were kind of highly skilled already and doing okay. Um, and that's not what we had started out with. Uh, we had started out with this idea that you could use technology to reach people who uh, lacked opportunities for learning and education and that you could create new opportunities for the kind of learning that we cared about, which I think is, fits into this creative learning um, framework. And so, well, what did we do? Uh, about three years ago, we fundamentally changed course and we kind of let go of this assumption that you needed to be online uh, to get to scale and that you needed to focus it around the dissemination of content. And we partnered up with public libraries in the US, first with Chicago Public Library to see if this idea had value. And what we did is we organized learning circles that would meet once a week at a public library supported by a librarian who was not a subject matter expert, but who was more of a support person there that could help them get online and uh, loan out laptops if they needed computers um, and those kind of things. And we curated a, a set of online courses, many of the MOOCs, many of the MOOCs that you made, so thank you for doing that. Um, and uh, we made those, kind of curated a list of those, made those available to the librarians, and the librarian, librarian said, this is a good course for my community, so they offered it at the community. People would meet once a week, uh, come together. And so the results have been very encouraging. We're, we have now partnerships with over 20 public library systems in the US. We've run over 150 learning circles in public libraries. We are in Paris and we're in Kenya. And so the model is spreading. We're obviously not at the scale of millions of people. But the, the scale thing that I find interesting here is there are over 100,000 public libraries in the US. 
And this model could easily spread to many of them. And I think then you are talking about the kind of scale that many of you are talking about when you're looking at your data of millions of learners or hundreds of thousands of learners. You could easily imagine an infrastructure in the public libraries supported by digital technology that reaches the same number of people with a very, very different uh, model of learning. And so I'll end with just an appeal to you because one of the things that we are building on is this infrastructure of public libraries, but the other infrastructure are the courses that you are creating. And those courses have traditionally been open so that people could just take them and access the materials and they could work through the materials with their learning circle at the library. But increasingly those courses are being closed. And so I would really encourage you to avoid creating artificial scarcity. When you've made those courses, please leave them open for us. Okay, well, it was, it was great to hear a little background of several different initiatives. I think we saw lots of common themes. Uh, actually, I was gonna add some thoughts before opening up the conversation on a way that uh, I've sometimes thought about this issue of creative learning. And in our group here at the Media Lab, we sometimes talk about it as we try to support creative learning experiences, we think about the importance of doing it through four guiding principles. They each begin with the letter P. We talk about projects, passion, peers, and play. And since I often look at the world through this lens these days, uh, and listening to these three presentations, I heard this come up a lot. In almost all of them, they were talking about you know, you know, the, 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 these themes in various ways. Uh, just in thinking about it, we talk about a project-based approach, where it's not just a matter of uh, delivering some information, or even engaging in problem solving. But going beyond that thing, the best way to engage in problem solving is in the context of a project, where people start with an idea, carry it through, uh, do prototypes, adapt it, revise it uh, in consultation with others. Uh, we feel that the best way to support creative learning experiences is enabling people to work on projects that connect with their interests and their passions, that people are willing to work longer and harder make deeper connections to ideas when they work on things they care deeply about. Um, creative learning doesn't happen by yourself. It happens in con connection with peers, learning with and from others. I think we saw that in all three of these presentations, the way about uh, learning experiences, connecting with peers as part of the learning experience. And then play, maybe it wasn't mentioned as directly. That was the one that maybe wasn't mentioned as directly. And when we think about play, we don't think of it just as a matter of having fun, but rather, a playful approach to the world, a type of engagement where you're constantly experimenting, trying new things, testing the boundaries, taking risks. The creative learning requires that type of playful engagement where you're willing to experiment and try new things. And I think in my group, we tend to try to apply these ideas in the technologies and activities we develop for kids, technologies like Scratch, which was mentioned. But we feel that the same ideas apply to learners of all ages. And I think we see it in the presentations here was talking about certain things in the K through 12 area, but also in teacher professional development, as Karen mentioned, that the teacher experiences should be, in some ways, also important to have creative learning experiences as the, as the students. And I think also, it would seem to me, these could play a role, and, and Philip also talking with adults. But maybe with this as a framework, uh, one thing that I think can be a challenge is if we take these or some of the things we are looking for in creative learning experiences, some of these things are more difficult to scale. I think one of the challenges we see is if we really believe in creative learning, where it's not just a matter of you know, being able to deliver information or having people learn a fixed set of you know, facts and skills, but really being able to uh, you know, come up with creative solutions to new and uncertain situations, how is it that we can scale that up? We see on some of these, it's a challenge. If we want to support everyone's passion, well, everyone has different passions. How do you do that at scale? Uh, if you want to support projects, which can take time and weave through different cycles. Uh, how do we deal with that and trying to do it at scale? So there are challenges, I think, with all of these. So maybe I would open up to the panel with talking about, we hear about some great projects to work on, but maybe we can shift a little bit to the challenges we see. Uh, well, first of all, how your projects might connect with these, but maybe more importantly, how you see the challenges and why, especially in trying to take these, these ideas to scale. So I don't know if, who wants to kick it off about some of the challenges that you see as some of the most important challenges. Chris, go by. Okay. I was going okay. to say ladies first. This has been okay. nominated. <laughs> okay. So I guess the, 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 the first challenge I briefly mentioned, and I think it's, it's being open to criticism. If you, if you want to open something for uh, a different way of teaching, or a different way of learning, you have to understand that the community will have different speeds of adoption. 
Um, and if, if you open room for those, uh, you will have more possibilities of success. Um, something that was mentioned by, by, by Philip, I think is, is, is right, is uh, move forward, starting from the small scales, and I mean, what, it might not be planned, but small scales, and then you can see how can you enlarge them in a systemic way. Um, and something that I think is really important to, 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 pro to foster creativity is to promote those who are doing well uh, in order to create this contagious network uh, that can be inspiring for others. And finally, uh, I think one of the things that we do when we foster creativity is we connect the old with the new. And this uh, possibility of creating bridges between the, what people know and what people feel comfy, uh, comfortable working with. Uh, and these new scenarios, I guess you open the field in a much more attractive and, and seductive way. Um, yeah, actually, can we get the other slide back with the four? Oh, you have the four. Yeah, I, I, I like that slide. And I also, I just realized, so we have this ongoing conversation about which is the most important peer. <laughs> um, and actually, peers, which is the one I care about, was demoted a little bit recently. It used to be projects, peers, passion, and play. And now it's projects, passion, <laughs> peers, and play. You, you didn't think I would notice, but I, I did. Um, but the, so, well, I just noticed one of the reasons why I love peers so much is actually you could use it for any of these four, four pictures, but you couldn't use the others uh, for those. So I feel like at the core of a lot of the learning that I love, you always have other people. And then you, the other projects, passion, play, are, are just as important, but that just kind of, it made me realize, like, why, why do I think peers are so important? Yeah, because they can be. Well, doing another thing you've, I think you've argued over time when you're promoting peers, is that as we think about new technologies, where have new technologies made the biggest difference? And I think I could argue that new technologies have potential for making a difference in all of these areas. So new technologies can support creative learning experiences mm -hmm. better because they can help transform all of these. I think you've made the point that you think it has a stronger opportunity to make a more transformational difference in peers than anything else. Well, especially if you think about the history of technology and learning. So I think there was kind of this early stage where computers, personal computers, uh, were becoming something that people would have at home and children would be able to spend time with. And so thinking about how a child engages with a computer was a really I important question. But then kind of 25 years forward, the internet happened. And so now it's, these, it's not just someone sitting in front of a computer by themselves, but it's actually hundreds of millions of people sitting in front of hundreds of millions of phones actually these days and being connected to some thing that mm -hmm. kind of you know, it lets us communicate with each other, do things together. So for me, like, the really amazing transformation of technology has been this, this aspect of con connection and, and the communities that emerge in these, in these networks. And so exploring those, but coming to your question of challenges, and I, I'm talking too much, but um, I think the, a lot of education is still organized in these much more packaged forms, right? It's like it's very clear who is a student in the class. It's very clear who is the expert. And now we're going to spend a semester learning with each other. Whereas online, it's like you don't know, you know, like that famous New Yorker cartoon, nobody knows <laughs> your dog on the internet. Um, so, you know, like the, it looks so different from education. I think that's one of the challenges for people to kind of, how do we make that transition to what's already happening online successfully in the education system? But I guess the same way that no one knows if you're a dog on the internet, no one knows if you're a teacher on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Not to draw the comparison. But I, I say that in that everyone, there, there, there's the potential for everyone to be a teacher. Yes. But actually, mm -hmm. I'd like to turn to you since you think a lot about teacher professional development. And obviously, there are people or professional teachers who play a very special role to support them. But there's also the opportunities now for peers supporting each other. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how each of these plays off of how we can, the importance of facilitators and educators but also the opportunities for everyone to be supporting others in, in various ways online. Yeah, that's a great question. And it actually connects to one of the biggest challenges that we've been experiencing, whether it's the scale of a K-12 classroom or something really large like an XMOOC. And it's about the intersection of projects and passions. As you were saying earlier, that if, you know, there's such a multitude of passions that people can pursue. And so how do you provide enough scaffolding support to engage people on a trajectory, ideally iterative, as they're developing projects? And sort of one of my actually early memories of being at HGSC is Anant came to visit, and he was talking about edX. Talk, and, Anant, oh, Anant, uh, does this crowd need yeah, Anant? Uh, just, okay. just in case. Head of edX, yeah. is that sufficient? Yeah. yeah. 
Would you yes, want to say no, more no, about? Okay. This, yes. <laughs> uh, and he was really excited about the possibilities for assessment of learning, and he was like, "The green, big green check will change everything in terms of learning." And <laughs> as I was sitting in the audience, I felt a little bit of like reluctance. Curiosity is also a word of like how that would translate into something that isn't right or wrong. I also see Scott Clemmer in the audience. He came to HGSC a couple of years after that, and he was talking about his work, large scale peer feedback. And so thinking about Phillips earlier comment about peers being able to leverage, amplify peers as facilitators, peers as mentors, peers, and that's where I think the special sauce is. And I don't think you have to be a teacher in the traditional sense, but how can we leverage that as a way of overcoming some of those challenges related to, we want everyone to engage and follow their passions and creative learning experiences. Yeah, following up on this thing about the passions is one that I'm particularly passionate about. <laughs> uh, and Sometimes these days, there's a lot of talk about personalized learning. And sometimes people will talk about that as if it's a way to deal with this, that you can deal with people in an individualized, personalized way. Uh, I personally have some questions about the way that personalized learning often gets out there isn't necessarily really connecting a passion. So even though it's individualized to a certain extent, is it really individualized in the way that we're talking about when we say passion? So actually, I'd be interested in how each of you thinks about the idea of personalized learning and how it relates to the work that you do. I'll go last. Come on. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Yeah, I, I can surface worries that I have. Yes. I think my biggest worry is, I mean, I think we can agree, probably collectively, that there is no consensus around what personalized as a signifier means. Larry Cuban had a great piece last month sort of trying to map the train a little bit, but it's clearly very fragmented. It means lots of different things to lots of different people. That said, I feel like a lot of the sort of more popular definitions of personalized learning confuse choice and agency. And certainly, particularly in K-12 settings that I'm really excited about, I think choice, some choice is better than no choice, but I also don't want people to be prematurely self-congratulatory, yeah. that it's not the same as kids defining and pursuing their own learning goals. To, like if you're just being given you know, choices from a menu, that's just, right. that's just not the same thing. Well, there are a lot of where it's just, it's sort of taking the traditional curriculum and say you can choose which order to do these things yeah. in. It is some choice, but not real agency or, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, so I, I have lots of, you're much more, you're much better at voicing constructive criticism than I <laughs> usually am. I have very strong feelings about personalized learning. Um, and actually it's something that Catherine, who is also watching the Twitter feed, but she, um, she said at one of the meetings, she said uh, it should be personal, not personalized which somehow stuck with me since then. And it made me ask, when we're talking about personalized, who is doing the personalization? Mm -hmm. And I feel like too often in the, in the new system that we're all so excited about, it's some artificial intelligence system that is personalizing the learning for me or for a child. And I think that is exactly the wrong way. I think a teacher personalizing learning can be a great experience. My parents personalizing learning for me is wonderful. It's like supporting, scaffolding, but directing or limiting or kind of engineering my learning path so it's gonna be more efficient, those things really, like that's not how I learned, that's not how, how I enjoyed learning. And so I, I, I'm worried that we are, again, maximizing and scaling something that we now have the technology to start doing, but we are not really maintain, we're not really preserving what the way that learning happens best using this new technology. So I see personal learning has been always personal, forever, right? The way that we decide what information we value, what feelings, what context, and what people we trust. Um, but we tend, in, the, in the discussion, we tend to mix personal learning with, uh, with ed, uh, personal education, which is not the same. Uh, so with the use of this technology, we tend to move in this direction that we can provide a highly customized offer to a learner. Um, I don't think we are that close yet. Uh, the, we saw incredible projects the, uh, yesterday and today in terms of content recommendations and assessment, but uh, I think there are still plenty of, plenty of roads to move in this direction. Um, and I guess that has to do with um, 
the process of learning at the end of the day has to do with your own experience. Uh, and many of the things that have to do with your experience are not really rational, they deal with your feelings. Um, and I guess the algorithms still have plenty of work to do in order to uh, catch that part of the, of the learning experience. Yeah, I guess it, to me, it also comes to the many different ways of using the incredible new technologies that are available. Uh, as Philip was saying, there's a lot of work that's going on of trying to have the technology be smart in a way that's able to feed you the appropriate next question or feed you the appropriate information at the appropriate time. Uh, and there's potential there, but a very different use of the technology that also connects to personalized uh, would be helping you connect with other people who share your interests. Mm -hmm. And that's it also it gets Absolutely. opened up by the technology, but it's radically different than the other. So there's these very diff different approaches. And I often get frustrated when people just think of technology leading down one path. And obviously those are two, in my mind, very, very different paths. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that can be opened up you know, through the technology. And yes. the other thing that in this direction, sorry, is the distinction between adaptive education and adaptive learning. I guess we all aim for have, having adaptive learners all the time in this yeah. changing context. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Karen is exactly right that there is, when we say personalized learning in everyone's mind, there's a totally, or there, there are probably lots of different pictures of what we think that means. And it's a little bit the same with learning at scale, right? Yeah. Like in some people's minds, it's broadcast. In other people's minds, right. it's propagation or right. spreading an idea or. Well, again, scale, a lot of times with tell people initially when they hear about scale, they think about the need for uniformity because it's mm -hmm. easier to do something when you have one thing because to many people. So uniformity often comes with it. But if you take the idea of trying to connect up using the ability to scale to connect with people with shared interests with one another. It can be a large scale, but opening up lots of subcommittees within the large scale seems there's potential for that, but still challenges with it, but, but the potential with it. I guess that sort of connects the passion and the peers. Of course, with all these, is trying to connect them together is where you get the, the richest benefits. So I think that trying to think more about connecting passion and peers would be one thing there. So. I mean, one other element that came up strong in all the uh, as I was listening to the three of you present, was the physical space versus the online space. Mm. It turns out all three of you talked about the importance of physical get-together. Uh, and maybe talk about a little bit more about the ways of combining these two. I mean, you already have touched upon it, but about some of the different strategies in thinking about scale of, of how productively combining the two, uh, you know, in person and online. Well, may I, I'll, I'll even start off to seeing Karen here. One of the examples I like the best was something that uh, wasn't talked about yet, but that Karen started a number of years ago. As the Scratch community was getting started, uh, we decided that there was all this activity online that seemed great, and we had a meetup for kids here at the Media Lab. We invited kids in the area, it had to be local kids, uh, to come and meet one another. It was a great experience that a lot of them had seen each other online in the community, and it was great that they met one another. Uh, and that was a good experience. But the important thing that happened was uh, Karen then suggested, well, we can't really scale that ourselves. You know, we can't start doing that same thing that we did at the Media Lab. And basically, what Karen and others here did was to put up the basic framework for how we had created Scratch Day here and just put online, why don't other people create their Scratch Days? The second Saturday of May, everyone can do a Scratch Day. Here's some ideas of how to do it. And basically, it always struck me because from a relatively small amount of effort, don't mean to minimize the effort you put into it, a relatively small <laughs> amount of effort, it launched hundreds of, you know, hundreds of projects around the world and had an incredible diversity. It was not cookie cutter projects for great diversity. So for me, that was a great example of there's all this online activity, but if you plant the right seeds, you can then have lots of different, like plant the seeds is the wrong metaphor, but somehow it's distributing things that other people are planting the seeds in many different places uh, to, to have coming together. And I guess that's, it probably connects some with some of the P2P U things you were talking about. Starts online, but then have lots of individual meetups. Maybe Actually, the, um, you mentioned EdCamps before, mm -hmm. which I'm also a huge fan of. And we had the chance, so another project that Catherine is involved in, um, or leads actually, is called the Unhangout platform, which is an online platform for unconferences, essentially. And it was very inspired by EdCamps in the physical space space, like how could we do those kinds of events online? And then we had the opportunity to partner with them, which was kind of like, <laughs> it was like the unconference people are doing an unconference online. Um, but what was interesting for us was we only did two ad camps online, and the two events led to, I think, 11 offline events. 
So people would be recruited into the ed EdCamp community and they connected online, which was just an hour, it was easy, you could stay at home. They got inspired and they were like, okay, I'm gonna do one of those in my school next. So using online to kind of spread the model, but then you end up having a lot more offline events. I'm sure you did the same by making the materials available, sending out emails and, you know, and then that, it kind of grows from there. So I think the connection between the two is really interesting. I think with, with saying more about in Uruguay with the, uh, about connecting those two, the in-person and online. One of the things that they do on a regular basis is they invite a, a famous author, a painter, a photographer, um, to have a conversation with the kids. So the kids they get all online from the different schools with this video conference system. With one, many to one is the conversation. And they ask questions to, the, to this expert for an hour or so. And, and it's, it's fascinating because, it's, of course, it's, it's remote, but at the same time, it's, it's this feeling of co-presence in which they are all together discussing. And I, I guess one of the challenges is, is to play with these new boundaries, new distinctions between virtual and remote and face-to-face and -face are every time more blurry. Yeah. Oh. So, so maybe we'll take a look at, are there some questions you want to share that Catherine can share from the audience? Sure. Um, there are a bunch of good questions on Twitter, so if you, if you have any more, tweet them out. Um, but uh, here's a good question, I think, um, on the topic of personalizing. What becomes the role of designers um, and instructional designers who have expertise in um, structuring good learning and um, when we're thinking about students following their passion? How do those two interact with each other? I'm, I'm happy go, to start. Uh, it actually connects to a different, not to be the panel's worrier, yeah. uh, but another panel I have related to personalized learning that in efforts to more crisply define and narrow in what we mean when we meet, when we're talking about personalized learning, I do worry a little bit that all the attention on the individual, with all the attention on the individual that will lose sight of the group dynamics. And partly, every time I look over, I see Philip, and I see him underneath Pierce. So it's like a, a good reminder. So I think instructional designers have an incredibly important role to play in keeping both the individual and the collective intention. And this is not a new idea. I mean, John Dewey was writing about this as the bedrock of you know, powerful learning experiences, that yes, you need to help the individual pursue their passions, but you also want to think about how that that, that contributes to the collective. So always keeping an eye on that dialectic that it's not either or. I mean, just to, with dialectics, but I think individual and collective is one good one. But another one that I know that you've written about a lot uh, is about the, the between structure and agency. And a lot of times mm -hmm. people see those in opposition. And it does come up from the point of view of designers about how much freedom to you know, support and how much structure to put in. Uh, maybe you can talk a little about how you see the, the, the the play between structure and agency. Yeah, my fascination with sort of structure and agency as contracts constructs came from working with you and the long history of constructivist and constructionist thought where for a long time and not unduly um, people thought like oh if you want to, to support people in having creative powerful learning experience you just need to get out of the way like kids know what to do any interference from teachers or other adult parties is just making things worse robs the learner of opportunities for, for, for discovery yeah. exactly um, and that just was not resonating with what I was seeing in the field so my dissertation focused on intensive classroom observation around what happens when you interfere a lot or you don't do anything at all. And so there's this very romantic vision of, and this connects to a point that Philip made earlier that I think is so important, and there's been really great work coming out of HarvardX and friends about like, actually the people who are benefiting most from these like open online systems are kind of autodidacts. They're already really successful learners. These are people who know how to learn. And so you wanna really think carefully about individuals and, and what they need in terms of structure. So. Too much structure, definitely bad. Too little structure can be equally catastrophic, and you really want to be constantly thinking about the negotiation. Not to make things harder for designers, but that is yet another dialectic right. to negotiate. And the right type of structure. So oh, it's yeah. not just the amount, but the types. Of mm -hmm. so. Maybe one other element I'd throw in there is when I think about for designers, trying to help people understand the process of designing for designers. So yeah. I think too many people when they think about the design process, they're trying to think about creating a particular experience that everyone's gonna then go through this experience. 
as opposed to creating an environment that enables people to design their own experiences. Uh, and I think that takes a different, a, a different way of thinking about design. So for me, and I think it relates to all of these, but especially projects. If you really want to engage people on projects, it's less about coming up with a specific you know, set of intriguing problems for them to solve, but rather creating a context where they're going to develop projects based on their passions and in collaboration with peers. Uh, but how can you create the context where people will engage in designing their own projects? But that's a challenge, but it feels to me that's the most important challenge for in, in, instructional designers. Yeah, I agree, and I, I mean, I, I would just add, I think their role is becoming even more important yeah. in this new world. Uh, and it's just, it's not just instructional designers, it's also technology designers, yeah. because technology and content embody pedagogy. There's no escaping that. And so as we're designing these tools or as we're designing this content, I think we always have to think about what's the, what, what is the, learning that it enables. But trying to set that up and do it at scale does have its challenges. So I do think that, uh, I do think sometimes things get tilted, whether in technology design or instructional design, gets tilted away from designing for designers because it's harder to do that at scale. So trying to figure out better ways of doing that at scale, I think is one of the challenges. It's, it's pretty easy to describe the idea of creating an environment that allows people to be designers, but to, to actually let it play out and have people put it into practice is, I think, a real challenge. Again, Karen earlier mentioned John Dewey, uh, who, again, was talking about a lot of these ideas a century ago. And in talking about his approach to progressive education, which connects to a lot with the ways we we're talking about creative learning, he said that his approach to education was simple but not easy, yeah. meaning that you could easily describe it. You know, you could, well, what is it? You can describe it in four <laughs> Ps, or he had some of different words. That does, just because it's simple to describe doesn't mean it's easy to put into practice. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's worthy. So, but to, to me, I feel that's where people need to put their energy. So, I'll take another one. So another question is, how do you balance changing educational practice with supporting teacher agency? I think that was a question specifically to Karen and Christoba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't it? I, I saw the tweet. Uh, <laughs> well, the two of the, well the, both of you, you both talked about teacher professional development, the, uh, so it might be great to hear some of your thoughts on that. But Chris, do you want to start? Okay. Well, I would say I, go, I would go on the safe and then say 50 and 50, but um, when, when the OLPC program started in Uruguay, I was telling yesterday to someone, um, Plenty of teachers were reluctant to this idea because they were not asked if whether it was a good idea to bring the laptops into the classroom. So there was a little bit of contingency. And some of them was, were saying, no, 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 we don't want these laptops in our classes. But at the same time, the parents were incredibly excited of having this new device. So it's, it's an interesting process in which the community is the one who encourages the teachers to explore these new things. Um, I don't know in the US, but in other countries, teachers are incredibly reluctant to change. Uh, so, of course, the challenge is to explore seeing, uh, transformations which are gradually for one side, and the other one which include their voice. Uh, which usually takes more time than only top-down innovation. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be way more consistent. So, I, I think this is, this is something that has to be uh, considered at the very beginning, and that has nothing to do with training providing expertise in a specific kind of software, but much more from a pedagogical perspective to understand why these things can make sense in, a, in this changing landscape. I mean, plus one, I totally yeah. <laughs> agree that it doesn't, you can do everything, you just can't do everything all at once. So the idea of gradual change really resonates with me. I mean, revolution is a lot sexier sounding than evolution, but I think in terms of the, inertia that K-12 education offers us, I think there's a lot to be done even with these like small steps. Those matter a lot, yeah. so. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm also always often intrigued by the small steps and, and loving when schools do something that again, it's sort of more project-based approach. Trying to change the whole curriculum in that way is clearly a big you know, lift. But you see schools that are doing things like setting aside uh, a month of the year it's going to be done a little bit differently. Uh, and I like that as a way, because also I think that could also help influence it to spread further. So trying it in some ways, or some schools, I don't know if people know about the 
movement of if Google can give their employees 20% time to work on their own projects, why not students as well? They should have 20% of their time to work on their own projects. Uh, so trying to find some ways of getting, you know, uh, inserting some of these different approaches uh, is, is a good way to get started to see how they might take root and flourish. Um, so as we steer instruction into a structure of projects, does that discourage play and agency that can emerge from play? Who asked that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it sort of sounds like it's looking, suggesting a tension between projects and play. play yeah. Hmm. As we steer like, instruction into structures of projects, yeah. doesn't that discourage play? and the agency that emerges from play. Yeah. I guess to me it depends on what pe how people think about projects. Yeah. So it feels that they must be having, the crisis sounds like a more restricted way of thinking about projects. Because I think the way you talk about with the spiral, mm. I, I don't see the, the tension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do think the, the core crisis, it does come back to the agency. So obviously if it's, uh, at least for me, there's certain things that, uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of project-based approaches where everyone is told what project to work on. Yes. Yeah, paint it's, by numbers. It's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and even things that, and some of them can have value. And you, I don't want to dichotomize, because there can be good experiences. Uh, but even things like, uh, you know, I've been involved, in, as mentioned, the introduction with the Lego company. And there's a lot of great robot design competitions. Uh, and, but, and in some ways, that's you're told a certain project with a certain goal for everybody to work on. And I think there are a lot of advantages to that. On the other hand, we can't lose sight of the fact that not everybody wants to build robots to, to compete in robot competitions and trying to make sure they provide these multiple pathways uh, to allow everybody to engage in, in, in things that they're most passionate about. I guess that's more focusing on making sure that there's the passion there. But I guess it's also sometimes these days when they're with some of the efforts to bring design into education, it's done in a pretty structured way, the paint by numbers, a certain, mm -hmm. system, a certain uh, rigidity in which it's brought into play that you go through a certain process step by step and making sure that that doesn't happen. So something that um, we have studied in Eurowise since the kids receive the laptop and they can bring it home, the kind of use that they do with the laptop at home and in the classroom is completely mm -hmm. different. And I, I think it has to do a lot to do with this play versus project. Um, because the, the, the play might not be gaming, as you were saying before, but trying for exploring based on your own interest. Um, and we see that this is really fostering the development of, of a number of skills and, capa and capacities, which might go beyond the curriculum, but they are really, really important. So I don't think it's that one is more important than the other one, but it's really important to, bring, to build these bridges between these different contexts in which you will foster different ways of learning. But, but uh, are you saying that you see the difference? Because I think when I think about projects, I don't see the difference in the same way. For me, working on a project is this like exploration. I'm trying something, and it never works the first time. Mm -hmm. So then I try something else, or I ask someone for their opinion. I look at what other people have done. So like all the things that I think of as playful exploration, that's how I how I work on my projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I can see how like other projects would look very differently, like uh, instructables often, which I think are great. But it's, it's very clear what I need to do step by step. And it's like right or wrong, right or wrong, right or wrong. And then at the end, I, everyone has the same thing. But for me, it depends a little bit on what, what type of project right. are we talking yes. about. And there's also there are different degrees of this, it seems to me, that a playful approach can let you take different pathways in a project where you're given a goal, but there are many different pathways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's easier to bring that into, to open up for that, to have people have a playful approach to explore different pathways. The thing that's harder, but I think is very important for creativity and innovation, is not just shifting pathways, but shifting goals. Right. It, you start with a goal, but through your playful activity, by tinkering with the materials, tinkering with the activities, it shifts, you realize that there's some other goal that you want to aim for, or you shift the way you're thinking about it. And, and I think that's really important in the creative process to be able to not just shift the path, but to shift the goal. That's, I think, more difficult to do in a lot of institutional settings, but really important. And a lot of this also requires time. I think uh, in a lot of the stru educational structures, things are structured whether you know, the hour-long unit or the hour-long yeah. class period or the week-long curriculum unit, 
doesn't give time for that type of mm -hmm. shifting of goals, uh, but is important to trying to figure out the ways to have an openness for that, I think it can be a challenge. Uh, any suggestions of how we make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> In the next three minutes. <laughs> Although maybe, I do think that's something, maybe, Philip, you could talk a little about. We did try, uh, I think several of us have tried to do some things with alternatives to traditional online courses to try to bring some of these ideas into play and try to leave it more openness to playful approaches, letting people do it at different times. You might, if you could say a few things with learning, creative learning, of course, that we worked on together to try to push against the traditional boundaries and try to bring these ideas in. I know, sure. Karen, you also did some things with the Creative Computer Online Workshop yeah. that also tried, maybe saying a few things yeah. about those. And there are lots of people, like, yeah, through, you know, yes. we're kind of building yes, on a yes, long sure. tradition of yes. connectivist yes, MOOCs yes. and the Exploratorium people in, in uh, San Francisco are doing really incredible things online. Um, but I think the general idea was more, so you are teaching this course here, and actually Karen teaches a, a, a similar a course around similar ideas at Harvard, so it's great to have both of you here. But it's great. Um, I said to Mal that Karen went off and did a much better job at Harvard, so it's great <laughs> when things like that happen. Yeah. Um, and so when we talked about online, you were actually quite reluctant initially. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think you said, well, I'm you know I'm I'll, I'm I'm happy to experiment with this, but we have to hold on to the things that I really care about. Like I'm I'm not interested in just doing this technology thing. So then. We started thinking about well, how? What's the experience for media lab students when they're sitting in this class? Not when they're, they're actually not sitting in this class very much. They're often working on projects with other people. Um, uh, and how would we translate that into an online environment? And we went. I would say the first time we didn't really get it. Uh, I think the first time we struggled because we actually tried to make it more similar to a traditional in-person class. And we filmed the lectures. We live streamed them. Uh, and uh, we kind of opened it up a little bit. And then the second time, I think we were a little more um, ambitious, so we designed an activity every week that would in, uh, encourage the kind of projects that we were interested in, where people would be allowed to change the goals. They would be allowed, or they would actually not be allowed, they'd be encouraged to change the goals, they'd be encouraged to come up with lots of different things. And we also, instead of having one kind of, this is the perfect uh, solution, and everyone compares theirs to the perfect one, what we did is we spent some time scanning through a lot of the projects that were being shared and highlighting diversity. So we would highlight something we found interesting about this project, we found interesting about that project, and sometimes intentionally picking projects where we didn't think the, the whole project was amazing, just to show that it's okay, like if you, you know, not everything in your project is gonna be great. So I think, I mean, there were lots of, we wrote a little report about it that you can find online, I think it's called Tinkering with MOOCs. Um, but there were lots of things that, but one takeaway I think that's hard to um, describe or tell people how to do that you really just have to try and experiment with is this uh, feeling of letting, giving up control to some degree. Because when, when you have thousands of people and they are all sharing projects, you can't look at all the projects. Some people are gonna say things you don't agree with. There's gonna be a lot of noise. And I think some in our team, and it was a, it was a real team of, of people uh, some of the people in the team really struggled with that initially and then really embraced it. So seeing that, but that's not something where we could write like here, you know, here are the guidelines for how to do this. I think you, you have to play with it and different people will find different models that work for them. And to be clear, we definitely see it just as a work in progress. <laughs> it, it's not that we get yes, the, yes. the model because it's one that I think we, there are some things we liked about, some things were really challenging. It's, but it's, it was great, it was, us, it was us tinkering and playing with it and it's an ongoing process. It's the one model where we know best what didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just say a few things about, uh, time is up. Yeah, okay. I just want to, because I, I know um, at oh, least yeah. one person was asking if they could use the microphone because they didn't have a, um, they don't use Twitter necessarily, so I was wondering if you still want to ask your question. So because we're running out of time, but I wanted to make sure that that happens. It's kind of appropriate that we give the last question to the face-to-face -face yeah. experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, the, not the online. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, Chin Wai from uh, CMU. I, I guess my question is somewhat related to this observation about asking questions on Twitter. Uh, it seems like I've been attending this conference for a couple of years, and the first year that I attended it, there was a lot of talk about what students were doing, right? There was a lot of listening to what students were doing, and we were all just really amazed that, oh my God, someone in the other part of uh, a completely different part of the world is using my lectures and is 
thinking about this. And I think that is the one thing that I wish we had more uh, insight about how to do. I think scale is also about listening, right? So if you've thought about how do you use scale to listen better, uh, I would love to have uh, some, some of your insights. Well, one quick thought, which I think is connected, I think one thing that I felt really stymied about in terms of understanding the learner's experience at scale, I say this both as a qualitative researcher but as an educational researcher primarily, is that what I, often what I care most about in a learning experience, there aren't auto, automa like automated ways of un developing understandings of it. And so I think that's what I've been most frustrated. Like I can get all sorts of data about things I don't really care about, but sort of the essence of what I care about. So I still feel very much stuck in like, I do sampling uh, from students and large scale learning experiences and do interviews with them, but that's, you aren't, that's, that's just a subsample, and you aren't really getting a full sense of what the experience is along dimensions that I, I care most about. So that's, I feel like that's a challenge, a struggle that I continue to wrangle. Back to this theme of using the technology to listen, feels like a good theme to end on, because I, I, do, think, I do think a lot of this panel is about sort of shifting away from traditional models of you know, delivery and trying to, to a greater sense of engagement. <laughs> So I think that's sort of very relevant to it. And maybe I will take to just to end with one note on a lot of the ideas, at least for me, but I, the, of all the things that I work on, but I think a lot of the ideas we've been talking about on the panel were deeply influenced by Seymour Papert, who as many of you know is a founding faculty member here, talked about those ideas a lot, passed away a year ago. And so it was, you know, I was thinking about as we were talking, it was in this room a couple months ago, we had a celebration of Seymour's life. And for that, we put together a bunch of short videos of Seymour talking on different issues. And one that just really struck me and is, you know, just sticks with me uh, was you know, Seymour saying that you know, education has very little to do with explanation. It has to do with engagement. Uh, and for me, that really struck. And I do think that connects with a lot of the things we're, that we were talking about today uh, about how we can make sure that as we use new technologies that have all these great new capabilities, how can we make sure it's not just about improving explanation, which is important, but to make sure we don't, aren't just thinking about that, but to always be thinking about and remembering that at its core, learning and education are about engagement. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch.